Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange, Bush and Danny coming at you with another Hot Commodities episode. We're talking a continuation of last week's episode, ADP values by round. So we're talking the best values in each round of your fantasy draft in uh, redraft stand, um, half PPR leagues or whatever. Uh, round 7 through 10 this time. We were originally going to do 7 through 12, but we had so many points on each guy that we just knew this video would be way too long and we didn't want to overload your brains on this uh, Thursday episode. So uh, Danny, how you doing before we hit the intro? Doing well, doing well. Yeah, as Corey mentioned, we just wanted to make it more digestible for you guys. Uh, a lot of big facts coming your way. We don't want you guys to be uh, a little overwhelmed by uh, just the greatness that we're about to present to you guys. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll hit the intro and then we'll see you guys on the other side. Are you ready, Jerry? I'm ready. Just want to make sure you're ready, brother. Show me the money. All right, so round seven, I'll throw the ADP up on the screen right now. Um, as you can see, uh, Keyshawn Vaughn actually came in in the round six and seven because we did the, we're doing this a week later. The ADP data changed a little bit. So Keyshawn Vaughn, like, get the fuck out of here. We don't want to talk about you. Instead, we're going to talk about the better running back in the backfield. And my first value, my must-draft player, probably in all of fantasy football, but especially in this round, is Ronald Jones. Ronald Jones, I've said this a million times, 93% of the time an RB has 250-plus touches and six plus touchdowns, they finished top 15. Rojo had 203 last year and seven touchdowns. And now Brady is running the offense, uh, who is going to use him in the screen game, who Bruce Arians has praised him on that aspect of his game. And Peyton Barber vacated 170 touches. Vaughn will be eased in. David Johnson, who was behind Andre Ellington and CJ2K in his rookie year, only got 5.2 touches per game. 5.2 in his rookie year with Chris Johnson in the lineup. Despite being excellent on those touches and coaches believing he will be a workhorse by Thanksgiving, which was said on All or Nothing, he was still not used until Chris Johnson got hurt. So I, don't give me Keyshawn Vaughn's going to step in and take Rojo's job. He's not going to. Rojo's working on his pass protection. He's working on his receiving chops. Everyone knows this. Everyone sees his Twitter uh, post from his trainer. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you mentioned uh, David Johnson. I mean, although some people on Twitter want to hype him up as uh, that guy, which he's still not. But yeah, I will, I will say in the 2015-2016 area, he was a fantastic back. And as Bush just mentioned, his rookie season, he was not used. He, he, was not he, used until okay, he failed to record 35% of the snaps in nine of those first 10 games before CJ2K got hurt. He also had less than 15% in five of those games. Less than 15% of the snaps. That's insane. That's like, what, 15%? Like, Dari Ogunbowale played like 30% last year. 15% is like, what, like eight snaps? Like, yeah. give me a like break. he didn't play at all, like the first 10 games. And Vaughn is not as good of a prospect as DJ was. For sure, for sure, yeah. No, when you're talking about Rojo, again, you mentioned, like, everybody knows this year, we mentioned in the previous video, these this RB ADP for guys that you're used to getting in the middle rounds, they're simply going in the top three, top four rounds. So the fact that you're getting Rojo here at the seventh round, when some of the guys going ahead of him flat out are just so much riskier, He's so much be less a of a sixth round pick like, by the time fantasy drafts come yeah, around. I, I mean, he was he used to be like a ninth, tenth rounder. Like that's so, insanity. And, and him and Vaughn are like I've gotten really close, and I think Rojo's actually surpassed him by most uh, standards by now. So I, I like Ronald Jones is is gonna be a sixth round pick, I think, by the time fantasy drafts come around. Is, is basically my point. Um, we can get into your for, uh, your first guy. For sure. Uh, again, this is not because of I'm a homer, not because I'm a Cowboys fan, but it's Michael Gallup. So uh, when you're talking about Michael Gallup, uh, me and Bush broke it down. Uh, the Cowboys targets from last year, trying to project forward for this year. Uh, before we recorded, and when you're looking at Gallup last year specifically, 113 targets in 14 games, which equated to almost 8.1 per game which is a pace of 129 across a full 16 in his second year. Second year. A third-round pick, second year. When you're looking at it, just based off last year, he was the wide receiver 17 on PPR points per game, despite only receiving six touchdowns and being second in the league in drops. So he had his struggles last year, even though his stats overall were fantastic. He developed at a rapid pace, yet there's so much that he could still work on in his overall game. And you best believe, I mean, especially the drop issue, like he's going in this offseason. That's the main area of concern. I'm sure he hears from his trainers, from his coaches, that he's going to be working on. So when you're looking at uh, Gallup, the main arguing against him is like, oh, they have C.D. Lamb, Blake Jarwin's going to have the uh, breakout. Like there's not going to be a lot of targets available. But you're looking at it. 
The team is second in the NFL with 190 vacated targets from the team last year. That's more than enough to split between guys like CD, guys like Jarwin, guys like Paul or Zeke. Like there, there's so much available volume to the point where why, is, why do people automatically assume it's coming from Gallup? So again, you're looking at Gallup. He is a consistent wide receiver too that can be had in the seventh round. Like I, you don't see a second year breakout player being had at such a discount because of one draft move, which yeah. it, it doesn't make sense to me because Gallup is still a fucking baller. So I don't know. I, we, lo- I love him as a draft pick. This is here, here, hear me out. Cause I know a lot of people are going to be like, have the same concerns. Well, CD lambs there. Mark Cooper still there. Like all that stuff. Michael Gallup is the perfect guy to draft use for this first six weeks and flip when cause CD lambs going to eventually, uh, once he gets his legs under him and he learns how to like play NFL receiver or whatever, like Michael Gallup will probably be like a top, like 15 receiver in fantasy at that point. And you can just toss Michael Gallup for, I don't know, whoever you want to trade for. If you want to get like JK Dobbins or something like someone who's going to be good in the second half of the year, I think he's like a perfect, like seventh round pick because I've, I've said this a million times games at the beginning of the season matter. Your draft uh, should be how you're going to win at the beginning of your season, not how you're going to win in the playoffs. For sure. I mean, even just like mentioning for the whole season, like, yeah, I do think uh, it's going to take CD time to develop, but even when he does, I mean, CD can get the targets, but I mean, Gallup is still going to have so much available to him yet. People just, people have to realize the Cowboys are going to score points. The Cowboys are going to have a lot of volume and Mm -hmm. depending on no matter who you have in that offense, they're going to get enough volume to be able to produce. You want pieces from that offense because that offense is going to be so efficient and so incredibly fucking high scoring this year that like ultimately you're getting a wide receiver two in the seventh round. To me, that's a no brainer. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't harp on Gallup enough. The fact that he's even falling this far after that such a good second year is mind-boggling. Yeah, I actually, like I said, I, I love him as a target, especially when you're trying to win like early in the season and you just flip him for someone. But um, uh, next up on the list, we got uh, Deshaun Watson, and I tweeted this out, and some people mistook it for uh, David Johnson slander was when it was in fact meant to be Deshaun Watson hype. Um, so in the five games that the Texans uh, failed to rush for more than 100 yards, Watson threw the ball 38.5 times, which is a pace of 616 pass attempts. In the six games the Texans allowed greater than 30 points, Watson threw the ball 34.3 times, it's a 549 tar- uh, attempts pace. Both of them happened twice, like both those two scenarios, in two, uh, in two games in, uh, in 2019. And in those games, he averaged 43 pass attempts. So my point basically is the defense got worse, like in, in Houston. The run game, much to people's chagrin in the comments, it got worse. Like Carlos oh Hyde as a better is a better pure runner than David Johnson. Yes, get yes. at me at the comments below. Give me all the smoke. David Johnson can't run the ball anymore. He's a great receiving back. I'm not talking about David Johnson's fantasy value right now. He's a great receiving back, but he can't run the ball. So yes, it's a downgrade from Carlos Hyde to David Johnson. Hey. Like Watson is is an elite quarterback too. Let's not forget this. Watson is the third best quarterback in the league, in my opinion. So you're going to get 575, 600 pass attempts from an elite quarterback. I don't care who his receivers are. Kenny Stills is going to be involved. Like Will Fuller is going to be involved. Brandon Cooks, Randall Cobb, whoever it is. Watson's going to make them fantasy relevant because he's that good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you're talking about Watson and incredible value, uh, you're mentioning DJ. We already broke him down in the video. You guys know why we're against him. But uh, still, there's people on Twitter that think he's somehow still the same player from 2016. Yeah, he's not. But- He's not, guys. Like, we literally broke down the efficiencies. Carlos Hyde was a better runner, in fact, than DJ has been even since 2016. So, if you're going to come at us on Twitter, at least I have the stats to back it up. On, yeah, like, some and people. don't come at us with on tape because tape is based on oh, – or the stats that people use on in efficiencies is based on the running back, not the offensive line. It's based on the running back, and it's based on tape. So, on tape, Carlos Hyde was a better runner than David Johnson, too. Um, we'll sure. get off of what, uh, unless you have anything uh, else on Watson. Yeah, I was just going to talk about Watson. I mean, again, uh, people are so quick to just dismiss him, to just throw him, throw mm-hmm. him off the cliff. Again, as you mentioned, he's, uh, I'm not, I don't have him as my third best, but he's a top six easily for me, like easily. Uh, when you're talking about Watson, I mean, he's just an elite playmaker in the sense that, yes, you, losing Hopkins is going to be the big factor that pushes him uh, down people's rankings. But, I mean, they, they have weapons. I mean, they still have. Uh, Brandon Cooks, they added. Will Fuller's still there. Kenny Stills. Like, uh, they, added they can Randall all run, Cobb. too. They can all get behind a defense, and that's great for your quarterback. Watson is very much capable. We've seen this in his career so far of putting up those weak winning-type quarterback games. 
For sure. I mean, I, I love Watson, especially if you can get him out of value, as Corey mentioned. I mean, he's going, what, seventh round right now? Like, that's yeah. insane. For sure. He's like the only quarterback that I'm willing to take early. If he's there in the seventh round, I'm literally going to pick him every time. Yeah, I mean, like, this guy was literally a fourth-round pick last year, and he falls three rounds in ADP because people want to take shit running backs and want to factor him down for no reason. Like, give me sure. a break. Take that value. Uh, now, we're going to talk about another guy that is going to be being completely disrespected by the fantasy community. The fact that he's even here in the seventh round is just insane to me. But uh, it's Julian Edelman. He is the most perennially disrespected wide receiver in fantasy, and it isn't close. No, it's Robert Woods, actually, but Julian Edelman's close. Fair, fair, fair. But, I mean, when you're talking about Edelman, he's as consistent as they come. Edelman has averaged over six catches per game and has been on pace for 1,100 yards in each of the last four years. He's coming off of a wide receiver nine PPR point per game season, and he's currently be taken as the wide receiver 35. Uh, guys, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time. He is not that 5,000-yard, 50-touchdown player that he was in his prime. Edelman did what he did last year with a, a Brady who has declined. So wh- who is it to say that Stidham can't fucking come in? And at least Even if it's get, Hoyer, man, Brian Hoyer can like, sustain Julian Edelman. It hurts it, like Nikhil Harry when, yeah. when uh, Jarrett Stidham's the quarterback instead of Brady, not Edelman and White. Exactly. And just to mention, I mean, oh, you wouldn't want a, a young quarterback. Like a young quarterback's going to feed his slot receiver. Like it's just, yeah, it always when he's always open. <laughs> like it's laughable to me that people are letting, like he's literally the definition of a surefire wide receiver too. And he's falling to the wide receiver 35 off the board. Like, come on, man. I'll talk about another guy that's similar later on, but it's just ridiculous. Don't let this happen in your guys drafts. Like this value is insane. Yeah. And if you play in a PPR league and you think he has no upside, quote unquote, Lucas hates that term. Um, <laughs> He has upside because he's going to have games where he catches 10, 11, 12 passes because, and, and in those games, even if he gets 60 yards, like 11 for 60, like that's still like a 17 point game. So dude, like, I won't name uh, the, the, the channel that I saw this on, but I was watching a video and it literally said, Oh, Julian Edelman is a bus candidate. He's probably just going to be that typical four catch for 40 yard receiver every week. Like, dude, he's that's not like going to go six four every week. 64 for 640 from uh, a guy who's going to, who's averaged six year, uh, catches per game and 1100 yards per year. Yeah. Like, and like, yeah, where like, are you getting literally this? four for 40 is his floor. Like if he goes four for 40, that's like his worst game of the year. Exactly. He's really going to get like 10 targets a game pretty easily. So I'm not going to call anybody out, but man, like I hate when I just see lazy analysis, yeah. like we're here to break it down for you guys. So just keep sure. with it. So uh, round eight ADP on the board right now. And this guy I've already talked about, and this kind of goes hand in hand with my round seven guy. If I get this stack in best ball, I'm taking it all day. Brandon cooks is my first guy. If Watson's going to throw that much, as much as I said, he will, he might um, cooks is going to see targets like cooks, like Fuller can't stay healthy. Kenny Stills has been on and off the field. Randall Cobb will probably play 16 games and be like a top 35 receiver because he's Randall Cobb. But uh, four straight 1,000-yard seasons for Brandon Cooks prior to this year. He missed two games in his entire career since his uh, since sorry since his rookie year because he missed a couple in his rookie year. But he's missed two games in the last like five years, and people want to label him injury prone. Yes, he has concussion problems in the past couple of years, but I mean they wouldn't have traded the what the 52nd overall pick for him or something like that for a guy who can't play football anymore. So they obviously know that he can still play. And it's not like Cooks has like hamstring issues like Will Fuller who's going to be in and out of the lineup all the time. I think if Cooks plays, man, he's going to be like what he's always been, like uh, 65 catches, 1,100 yards, and seven touchdowns. Yeah, I mean like we're you're having him here probably like right now is what, around the wide receiver 40 or so off the board, give or take? Um, get, yeah, yeah that's about where he's going, 38, uh, I think. That that's just insane. I mean, like people forget how consistent he was before this year. Like he was a top fifteen wide receiver in fantasy the previous what three or four years yeah. before last year. And you're getting and he did it with like three receiver. different teams too. You get him as the wide receiver thirty eight off the board. Like I get it. The risk is there because like oh it always seems like he's playing injured. I don't care. He's the wide receiver thirty eight. If he doesn't hit, if he gets hurt, what are you losing? Like, I don't understand people. Do they really know Stop what yelling. risk management is? No, no, no. I get, sorry. Do they really know what risk management is at this point? Because let's be honest here. If Brandon Cooks is going to play a uh, 16-game schedule, he's 
at minimum going to give you top 25 value. Yeah. And the fact that he can be had this low is just insane to me. His ceiling is pretty crazy too. Uh, he's never saw more than 129 targets. And that's like his highest target total of his career by like 15 targets. He's like 110, 115 target guy. If, if Watson throws as much as I said, he, he will, there's a possibility that Brandon Cook sees 140, 150 targets this year. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Uh, it's just, he always feel this, uh, feels this bill of just receivers that people, for whatever reason, forget. Similar to the guy I'm about to talk about right now, and that's Marvin Jones. So when you're looking at Marvin Jones, he had a wide receiver 8 PPR pace with Matt Stafford in the lineup last year, and he can be had as the wide receiver 38 off the board right now. Like, I don't – where do you get wide receiver 8 pace with Stafford to fall into wide receiver 38? So, again – I've said it multiple times on the channel. I love the potential of Kenny Galladay this year, but straight up, give me the five round discount that you're going to be had with Jones. Like it, the discrepancy is ridiculous to me because their splits were literally identical with Stafford in the lineup last year. So, I mean, when you're talking about Marvin Jones, you know what you're going to get with him. You're going to get 65 catches, You can get nearly a thousand yards and you're going to, going to get probably eight to 10 touchdowns. He's going to give that if he stays healthy. And I mean, at the water super 38 off the board with that guy, with literal, legitimate top 10, top 15 potential, like, it's a no-brainer. I don't – again, beats me. I'm getting mad at the right audience. Way. They're not doing this. I know. No, I'm getting mad at whoever's letting these yeah, guys yeah. fall this far. Yeah, Jones is – I mean, like, he's he's basically a common guy that's always like a, like a late-round pick that everyone forgets about that is always better than he's, like, billed to be in the draft season. It's just because we kind of have fatigue with him, I, I feel like. I don't even know. Um, anything else on Jones or can I dig into this guy? This is a guy who's really becoming a target of mine lately. I'll let you have it. The, the, the audience already knows my distaste for this Jones slander. Yeah. So Tevin Coleman's my next guy. And I mean, remember the narrative that like, we can't figure out what's going on in the Patriots backfield. Like the Patriots backfield is legitimately a cakewalk compared to the Niners backfield. Uh, I've, I've talked about the tough run schedule in our, um, I believe it was our biz- biggest risks episode. Uh, about Raheem Mostert and why I think Raheem Mostert's a huge risk. I mean, the unpredictability of the Niners' backfield cannot be understated. If Mostert falters in that like tough start and maybe he gets injured or what, like whatever, Tevin Coleman's going to be involved more and more. And even with Mostert, even if he is playing well, there's enough rushing offense uh, or rushing volume in that offense to go around. Like they're the, the the second highest like rushing team in the league last year, but like. Baltimore was first, but their quarterback also runs the ball like 20 times a game. So San Fran, from a running back perspective, was the run heaviest offense in the league last year. So there's more than enough room for Raheem Mostert and Tevin Coleman to both produce. And like I said, Coleman, like who knows, maybe he's the starter. He also is going to get more receiving work than Raheem Mostert because even Raheem Mostert, when he was doing well, wasn't seeing a lot of targets. For sure. I mean, especially when you're talking about Coleman, for example, you mentioned like, uh, First of all, they lost Matt Breida. I mean, nobody's really talking about that. They lost Matt Breida, who is a very efficient back in the system as well. They're getting back Jared McKinnon, but let's be honest, we haven't seen him play in two years. So what can we really expect? Uh, to me, the two main cogs in the system are going to be Moser and Coleman. When you're talking mm-hmm. about Coleman, I mean, especially this is a huge best ball type of player. I mean, the unpredictability that you're getting with the Niners backfield, ultimately, mm-hmm. if you're going to bet on uh, one person to get 16 uh, games of just the highest snaps or the highest production. That's a fool, a fool's errand. Cause that's simple. I'll just, just take the cheapest option. Run. Honestly, like I don't even care who it is. If, if Coleman rise, like if there's a bunch of positive reports about Coleman and he starts rising over Mostert, I'll probably take Mostert. Like I want a piece of the backfield, but I don't want to pay up for it. And that's kind of how I've approached the situation last year. I didn't pay up for Coleman, but I took a lot of Brita and I mean, it didn't really work out. I, I don't think so, but like, Honestly, the Niners backfield, and yeah, like you said, especially in best ball, when you don't really know weekly who's getting the goal line carries and who's getting the targets and who's going to break the big run, like, uh, yeah, best ball, these guys are perfect. And I think Coleman is a great stash kind of to have on your bench if uh, if Mostert isn't doing well his first couple games. For sure, for sure. I mean, definitely in the ninth round, I mean, you're not going to be getting bell cow backs in this, situ- in this situation. So why not take a guy who figures to be in the tandem of the best rushing offense in the league? Like, yeah. To me, it's a no-brainer. So uh, segueing into my next guy, I kind of had a theme of uh, safe receivers for the first few. I'm going to go into a guy that actually has a little bit more risk. Again, 
this may not be considered a steal at this ADP, but he is the type of potential breakout receiver that I always look for in the 8th to 11th round, and that is going to be Deontay Johnson. So for starters, I mean, you're getting with Deontay Johnson. He was a third-round pick in last year's draft. Uh, broke out in his rookie – not really broke out, but had a, a really good rookie, rookie year. 650-plus yards, seven touchdowns with Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph throwing him the ball. That's impressive. But when you're actually, like, diving further into just how efficient he was, like, while playing last year, Matt Harmon charts his reception perception every single year. And according to Matt Harmon's reception perception, he had a 75% success rate against man coverage, which ranked in the 88th percentile, and a 75% uh, success rate against press, which is in the 81st percentile. So Big Ben is coming back, first of all, who's averaged 303 passing yards per game between 2014 and 2018. So I just charted how efficient Deontay Johnson was last year with those quarterbacks. Imagine him coming back with Big Ben, playing the Antonio Brown role in a Big Ben offense. He's going to be the efficient separator on the outside. Now, I'm not comparing him to Antonio Brown, obviously. That's not the goal. But again, he's going to play that role, efficient separator on the outside. So if you're taking him as a potential breakout player here in the eighth round, I mean, what do you have to lose? Like, maybe the floor is not there because you don't know how a quarterback's going to adjust to his receiver. But his upside is legitimately top 20. Like, if he hits and he takes that role, there's plenty of volume to be had. Again, as I mentioned, 303 passing yards per game with Big Ben between 2014 and 2018. For him to really carve himself up and have that second-year breakout that we covered in, in ride, ugh, wide receivers. So uh, what are your thoughts on Deontay Johnson? Yeah, I, lo- I, I made a prediction on Notorious' channel that um, Deontay Johnson would outscore Juju. Um, I'm not going to draft him over Juju. I, I, I think, like you said, I think Deontay Johnson carries a fair amount of risk because it was with a different quarterback. And yet, like, I, I've used the narrative to describe Preston Williams' connection with Josh Rosen of being like a second-teamer or whatever, which – could be a reason why Deontay Johnson was good with Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges. Like they might've just had better chemistry. It's possible that when Ben comes back, he prefers uh, James Washington, even like he, like he just might not have that kind of connection with Deontay Johnson, but in the eighth round, uh, like the metrics he showed for a rookie receiver from where did he go to school? Fucking Toledo. Yeah. He went, he went somewhere uh, like obsolete like that. I remember when he got drafted, I'm like, mm. you know, like I knew him. I didn't think he Yeah, I didn't really him, like, but, I wasn't like, okay, this guy's like, I know a couple people that were really, really high on him, but um, I yeah, like he that. showed a lot as a rookie and they're, they're, really they're, you can't go wrong when you bet on young players, like ascending players. And I think Deontay Johnson definitely fits that description. Again, as we said, like I, I love Juju, but I mean, we make the excuses for, oh, Juju didn't produce last year. Mm-hmm. Like, well, that was because the backups, blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, it affected everyone in the receiving core. Mm-hmm. And yet Deontay Johnson as a rookie still produced nearly 700 yards and seven touchdowns. So I mean, sure. you're looking at that. I mean, there's plenty of volume to go around between those two. I do think Juju bounces back at the end of the day. I mean, we saw what two wide receivers have been able to do in the Steelers offense for how many years, who's to say that Deontay Johnson can't fill that role. Obviously he's not Antonio Brown, but I can very well see in a thousand yard, nine touchdown type season. Yeah. Out of so uh, yeah. Yeah. Eighth round. Take it. All right. So into the ninth round, this will be on the screen right now for your viewing pleasure. Uh, we got Hayden Hurst up and everyone and their mother knows about Hayden Hurst. He's not a sleeper whatsoever. If anyone tells you he's a sleeper, they're lying because literally everyone in the fantasy industry is on this guy. And there's good reason for that. He, uh, there's 258 vacated targets in Atlanta. You said the Cowboys had the second most in the league. Well, the most is Atlanta. So an offense that will throw the ball 600 times in 2020, you can book that in ink. They are going to throw 600 times. They will lead the league in pass attempts. I will put that in writing right now that they will do it. And to top it all off, Dirk Cutter is, is, is dog shit for fantasy running backs, but he's a guru with tight ends. So um, Hayden Hurst, yeah, like wh- whether or not he's, whether he's talented or not, he's probably in the most tight end f- friendly situation in the entire league. For sure, for sure. I mean, I've harped on Hayden Hurst multiple times this offseason. Mm-hmm. If he doesn't get 100 targets this year, and I think that's his floor, yeah. I'll be so shocked, like beyond belief. Like, we, for, for instance, how many times I've compared his athletic profile to Watson Hooper's? He's a better overall talent than Hooper was. And we saw the extreme uses that Hooper got 18.5% target market share last year. Matt Ryan's just not simply going to change his tendencies because he's got a new player filling that position, one that's even more talented than the one he's replacing. So, yeah, um, and the Atlanta's red zone offense is, was bad last year, but it was actually good when they targeted Hooper. So, I, I mean, like, and Hurst has actually shown that in Baltimore that he was actually a decent red zone option. So, um, 
I definitely expect, man, I just expect Hurst, like you said, 100 targets is his floor. I think his, like, his baseline is like 100 and his ceiling is like 135, 140. Like, the offense is going to throw so much. Like, even if you give 300 targets to Julio and Calvin Ridley, like, that's still 300 left. For like, was Russell Gage Literally. getting 150 targets? Like, no. Like, Maybe, Todd okay. Gurley's not getting 100 targets. Like, it has to go to Hurst. Like, Hurst is the next option. Realistically here, I mean, when you're looking at projecting Atlanta for next year, uh, again, you mentioned it's going to be Julio and really we already know that. But aside from them, I mean, it's got to be Hurst. It's got to be probably a little bit of Gage. I mean, Gurley's going to get a little bit. But at the end of the day, you mentioned 600 at the minimum is probably going to be their passing attempts. I could very well see that, like, Bold prediction, maybe he hit in the 630 range. Like we saw the Rams get 626 last year. I can see Atlanta in their highest pass split last year, carrying over this year, even eventually breaking that. Like it's just unbelievable the amount of potential from a passing volume standpoint that the Atlanta offense can yield for next year. So again, Hayden Hurst, man, I will keep saying this. If people are going to avoid him because he's not a hot name, you scoop them every time. Like yeah. this is the the ninth round. This is like He's- literally the easiest breakout candidate of all time. Like I, I think this might be the easiest breakout I've ever like predicted in my life because like, I, I mean, like I've said, if you think the Falcons are going to be a good team somehow this year, they still led the league in neutral game script of pass splits. So like, even when they were in games, they were still passing the most in the league. So they're, they're, they're going to pass the ball a lot. You don't want anything to do with their rushing attack. You want everything to do with their passing attack. I've said it like 30 fucking times. For sure. I mean, they're definitely going to be a fun offense to watch. Another one that uh, is actually going to be a fun offense to watch, but uh, potentially hurt this guy's value because of a big offseason trade. I mean, we all know the name now. DeAndre Hopkins is in Arizona. But I do think there is enough volume for Christian Kirk to really bring value back to you in the ninth round. So when you're breaking down uh, the Arizona Cardinals to begin with, we all know, uh, oh, they they reverted to the rushing attack once they got Kenyon Drake last year. But again, we've said multiple times on this channel, we do think that Kingsbury's preferred system is the air raid offense, is spreading everybody out, distributing the targets equally, and ultimately having a higher pass split than they showed at the end of the last season. What are you looking at that? An air raid offense means that there's not one specific target hog in the offense. There's not one 30%, 28% absolute target market share dog, but everybody's going to have probably around 25 to 18% in that range. So uh, when you're mentioning Hopkins, I do think he can produce, but again, air raid offense. When you're mentioning Kirk, you're looking at him just last season, 108 targets in 13 games, 8.3 per game, 133 target pace over a 16 game season. And ultimately right here, I mean, in the ninth round, you're getting that's actually guy. shocking. I actually didn't know that. That's like a that's like a like wide. It's pretty hard not to finish as like a wide receiver too if you're getting 130 targets. Exactly, and we mentioned before. I mean, we expect fully. Kyler Murray's going to break out. DeAndre Hopkins is going to be good. Kingsbury system is going to be awesome. Why wouldn't the wide receiver two in that system be productive? I mean, we saw last year how many targets were available. For example, Terry uh, Larry Fitzgerald had over 100 targets last year. You don't think that's going to be a, uh, supplemented as he grows older between guys like uh, Drake, uh, Hopkins. Like, that's, they're going to equal themselves out. And ultimately here, like, I, w- I do think that Christian Kirk is at least going to get that 110 target baseline. And if he's doing that, I mean, he presents a uh, wide receiver two type upside. And you're getting him as your wide receiver three. I mean, plug him into your flex every week. He's yep. going to provide a safe floor for you and ultimately upside in that good of an offense that we all expect to break out. So... Uh, you're getting Christian Kirk here. Great value. Ninth round. Don't miss out. For sure. And another great value. Um, Tom Brady. This this one is really confusing to me because if you look at this uh, ADP in this round, Carson Wentz, Drew Brees, and Aaron Rodgers are and, and Tom Brady are the four quarterbacks that have an ADP in this round. There's not a chance in hell I would take those other three over Tom Brady. Tom Brady, like as I mentioned, I've mentioned this a couple times. If you haven't seen uh, the Buccaneers preview I did with Evan Winter, um, from Bucks Nation, he he also confirmed this opinion with me, and he actually covers the team professionally. He's not just like me; I pretend I cover the team. But um, Bruce Arians is is it's still his offense. It's not going to be New England's offense. I don't know why people think that. It's not going to be New England's offense. They're not going to sign going. a guy like James White and a guy like Julian Edelman just to run New England's offense. It's far more likely, and Bruce Arians has literally come out and said this himself that you can teach one of the smartest quarterbacks of all time a new offense with his influence, of course. They're not just going to, 
like pigeonhole him in. They're going to want his input on what plays he likes and what like, but they did the same thing with Jameis Winston. So that to me is just kind of irrelevant. So it's way easier to teach that guy an offense and help him create it than it is to teach the other 10 guys on offense, a whole new offense, even though they spent an entire year cultivating and, and learning how to play in it. And the weapons around you are basically as good as you're going to be in fantasy. And if Godwin and Evans are top 10 receivers and Gronk's a top 12 tight end and maybe Howard's even something and Scotty Miller's maybe something and, and Tyler Johnson's a contributor, Brady's going to be a top 12 quarterback. It's really just simple math. Like Jameis Winston was the same way last year. Everyone who was taking Howard high and, and Godwin high and Evans high, like you should have been taking Jameis Winston high too. Cause it's simple math. And again, like we've mentioned this before, Brady has never had weapons like this. Yes. He had Randy Moss and Wes Welker in 2007, but I mean, like Randy Moss, Wes Welker, and Rob Gronkowski weren't on the team. So you can add in one extra weapon. I think Brady could go nuts this year. Like he could absolutely snap. His ceiling is a quarterback one. Yeah. I mean, he, again, you mentioned like those weapons coupled with the fact that in general, I mean, his floor is high as shit too. I think there's no way he's not a top 12 quarterback. I agree. I agree. I think I have him at eight or nine right now. Uh, his ceiling is even higher than that. Yeah. His ceiling is crazy. See, I really, I really like that value again, uh, especially if you're going to take one of these middle tier quarterbacks, don't be spending it on fucking like uh, Aaron Rodgers going. Yeah. No, in the same round. Please like, do not take Aaron Rodgers over Tom Brady. God, or Brady uh, honestly, don't take Drew Brees over Brady either. I, I wouldn't take Drew Brees over Brady. Man, it's just, it's just shocking to me that like, that's the case. Like Rodgers is specifically just one that absolutely baffles me. Wentz too. Well, like Wentz is in a good off. Like Wentz has a kind of a good situation, but his weapons are nowhere near the Bucks' weapons. For sure. For sure. Uh, again, transitioning now, we're going to be talking about the 10th round. We, we both love Brady and his potential next year, but yep. transitioning to the 10th round, I'll start this one off. Uh, I actually have uh, two guys I'll get into that we talked about a lot on this channel. The first one I'm going to bring up is uh, McCall Hardman. Uh, again, I will acknowledge he is a risk because we don't know how the volume is going to translate. We don't know how much he's going to get. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, I mean, if you don't have enough volume, like you can't be viable. But when you're looking at it in the 10th round, you're getting a potential wide receiver two type upside. I know I've said that a lot this episode, by the way. Uh, in the 10th round, I mean, you're looking at, first of all, when you get with McCall Hardman, he was first in yards per reception, first in yards per target, third in target separation, first in quarterback rating when targeted, and first in fantasy points per target. When I mentioned this in the other video that we did uh, when we're talking about deep sleepers, 41 targets into six touchdowns, 14.6% conversion rate. Six of his 26 total catches went for touchdowns, 23% of them. Even if he gets just a slight uptick in value of volume, say he gets to that like 70, 80 target range, he could very well take over Sammy Watkins' role as a wide receiver too, which was 90 targets in 14 games. If he's able to do that, I mean, 10th round for the awesome in basketball too. Awesome in basketball. It, it, it's it's just insane insanity to me. So again, at the end of the day, I mean, 10th round for this high risk, high reward type player, like you, 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 we go for first place in fantasy. We don't go for fourth place. So I mean. He is the perfect upside play at this point in the draft. And if he doesn't hit, oh, well, 10th round pick. But if he does, the return on value is enormous. So yeah. don't, don't miss out on him. Yeah, and guys like Kirk and, and um, Deontay Johnson and, and Slayton, if you go running back heavy and you want to pick up like four or five of these guys, like there's probably a good chance that like two of them hit and you can actually use two of them. And then you just cut bait with the other guys. Like it's, it's – and I'll, I'll go get into another receiver right now who I believe – He's going to be the offensive rookie of the year if it's not a running back or quarterback. If, if it's a receiver, it's going to be Jerry Judy, in my opinion. Jerry Judy, I went in depth on him on, uh, on Monday's episode where me and Nick talked about our favorite rookie targets. And basically what I talked about was the addition of Pat Shermer and why it's so huge for Jerry Judy. Uh, in 2017, there was a UDFA, and his name was Adam Thielen. And uh, I guess he was a UDFA like a couple of years before that. But in 2017, he broke out. And he... I mean, he was a UDFA. He's not the most polished receiver prospect we've seen since Amari Cooper like Jerry Judy was. Um, he broke out when he was targeted 140 plus times out of the slot on over a 50% slot share. What I expect for Jerry Judy in Denver is to play the primary slot role for Drew Locke, who's a young quarterback, who's going to love Jerry Judy because he gets open and he creates yards after the catch. That's pretty much all he does. That's all he needs to do. Uh, after... Um, Pat Shermer was in Minnesota. He got hired by the New York Giants. And 
Sterling Shepard averaged a 115 target pace and a 23% target share in the 26 games that he played over the two years that Shermer was the head coach. So it wasn't just Thielen that he made into a great slot receiver. And yes, Shepard was already good before he got there, but his volume actually increased and his slot percentage and all that stuff increased. So uh, yes, Sutton is there too. I understand that, but the volume should be there for both guys and they operate in different areas of the field anyway. Like they're not going to be competing for the same targets. Jerry Judy's going to be taking away targets from guys like Melvin Gordon and potentially Noah Fant and Deshaun Hamilton and stuff. And while Cortland, Cortland Sutton is pretty much just going to get all the downfield work. So uh, yeah, like I, I just think Jerry Judy is primed for a, a, like an awesome year because people just kind of forget. And we did this with AJ Brown last year, how good AJ Brown was for how long in college matters. Jerry Judy was good his freshman year. He's got a lot of football under his belt. And I, I don't think he's going to be afraid of the big stage at all in the NFL. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I, I really like Jerry Judy and his potential year one. Again, if we're talking from a dynasty perspective, obviously my, my boy CD is number one. I have rugs. When we're one talking about year, I have rugs higher in both, but, but uh, Judy is, well, is I know. just talking. About, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just talking about Judy, like uh, I just wanted to mention that when we're talking about Judy versus lamb versus like, even other guys that people want, like Justin Jefferson. I do think that Judy can seamlessly transition into ultimately, as you mentioned, a really high target role. I mean, Pat Shermer is known for having offices that just sling the ball. I mean, we saw it again, as you mentioned, Minnesota when Adam Thielen broke out. We saw it last year in the, uh, on the Giants. I mean, and Case Steve Keenum was, was the quarterback of that team too. It's not like they had like some elite, like it wasn't even Kirk Cousins then. Like Drew Locke only has to be Case Keenum, really. For sure. I mean, and Drew Locke... Uh, we're, we're talking about him. I mean, fuck, he, he, he has potential to seriously develop into a really good quarterback. And ultimately here, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Judy and uh, Sutton both got around 120, 130 targets. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be that much volume to go around. So uh, when you're getting Judy, again, as you mentioned, he's going to play that slot role. He's going to play that Emmanuel Sanders type role for that offense. Uh, we saw what Emmanuel Sanders was able to do in Denver even for the, for the longest time. So who's saying Judy can't do that, especially if you're getting him here again, 10th round. I mean, why not? For sure. For sure. Uh, tr- again, transitioning into uh, my guy, my, my final guy for the episode. Corey's going to have one more after this. Uh, it's uh, a guy we've talked about a lot in the channel. I mean, if you guys have been following us and you don't know by now, I'd be heavily shocked, but it's uh, Darius Slayton. So wide receiver from the New York Giants. So uh, the main bullet point that I really have is mostly his growth. I was a, like a rookie from last season with his quarterback, who was also a rookie from last season, Daniel Jones. So you look at it, Darius Slayton didn't have a cemented role all season, like for the full majority of the season. Yeah, he still finished as a top 35 receiver in fantasy last year. So when you're looking at Darius Slayton, again, the, the, the risk may be a little higher simply because there's mouths to feed. But man, if he's able to establish himself again under Jason Garrett's lineage as a guy who loves having his outside wide receiver one produce in a fantasy perspective, Darius Slayton can easily step into that role and give you a top 20, top 25 type upside, especially if he's able to establish himself and his connection with Danny Jones. Again, risky pick, but in the 10th round, as I mentioned, we go for high risk, high reward players that will pay off. So if you're getting this guy and he gives you wide receiver two type value, I mean, you're getting a steal. So uh, I know Corey loves Darius Slayton. You want to, you want to touch up on him? Uh, Not really. You basically summed it up. He's just going to, Again, like I, I pretty much said the same thing with Hardman. You can't go wrong betting on – and uh, Johnson too. You can't go wrong betting on young receivers who showed potential, especially as, as rookies. Like Darius Slayton was one of like four guys who was a top 35 receiver last year uh, who was a rookie. McLaurin, um, A.J. Brown, and, and D.K. Metcalf being the others. Like you want guys like that. Like you don't want guys on the decline. You, guys, you want guys on the upswing. So – uh, I definitely agree with the Slayton pick. And into our last guy, this is a very obvious name for a lot of people, and it's Alexander Madison. I mean, he's the second best handcuff in fantasy football behind Kareem Hunt, of course. And he's going to have standalone value as well. Um, I mean, I don't know really what to make of his ADP because it's all going to really depend on what the Dalvin Cook situation is. If Dalvin Cook is there, uh, Dalvin or Alexander Madison might go a bit later than this. He might be like 11th round pick or something. But if Dalvin Cook holds out, he's going to be like a fourth, fifth round pick, if I had to guess. 100%. I mean, we saw what he's able to do in small spurts last year. Again, you mentioned the standalone value. Like, there was times – I was a Dalvin Cook owner last year. Man, there was times where you see them both on the field. They look the same 
Like it literally yeah. the exact fucking same. So you see fucking Alex Madison running for a touchdown. I'm like, let's fucking go. go touchdown. And I'll see, oh my God, that's not 33. That's 25. Fuck sakes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're mentioning Madison. I mean, he fits that Viking system perfectly. And if anything were to happen to Cook, say, again, for example, the holdout, or he's a very, uh, in, I don't want to say injury prone, but like he's kind of that at this he's point. He's prone to injury uh, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I don't want to put labels, but I mean, I'll put a label. <laughs> uh alex madison can easily step in and provide you top 10 top uh, type upside in a week if cook ever goes down so getting him here again in the 10th round as i mentioned like that's uh, as such low risk at this point that like the upside's way worth taking him here so again if, instead of taking those like crappy fucking mid-round running backs just stack up a couple at the top and then take upside plays here i mean that's your best bet so i definitely like the madison pick i think that's a very good uh value here especially in the 10th round for sure um, all right. So thank you guys for watching. Make sure you guys like, um, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, uh, to get notified when we upload videos, we upload a shit ton. If you haven't noticed by now, um, give us your favorite, uh, ADP picks. I'm probably going to get some hate in the comments over David Johnson. I'm kind of used to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, make sure you guys are jo- join up in the discord too. We don't, we don't plug that enough. We want to get as many people in there as possible. We want to give you guys as much advice as we can about dynasty, about redraft, about, I don't know, best ball, like whatever you want to do. We're always dropping uh, drafters mocks in there too. And uh, make sure you guys, if you sign up for drafters to do best ball mocks, make sure you guys use our code. We're the little guy. Don't use the big guys' codes. Use ours. Um, So uh, without further ado, guys, uh, take care and enjoy your Thursday. Peace out, y'all.